Well, we are headed down the home stretch in this series, Uh, a series that we started uh, really more than three months ago. I guess it'll be four months uh, by the time we're done, but I think time well worth it because our aim in this series has been to love God with all that we are, from head to toe. And so we've looked at how do we do that with our body? our soul, our heart, and we have arrived at the mind. And so we're currently just trying to deal honestly with what, the further we go in this, the more convinced I am, so many people experience this time of year, a battle of the mind that can turn even a white Christmas, blue. So, if you didn't get a chance to listen to last week's talk, even though I'm the one that gave the talk, I'm going to encourage you to listen to it, all right? Because of how much we learn about dealing with depression from Psalm 42, all right? I encourage you to listen to it if you had another chance. But today, it's a similar, yet a different battle of the mind. Um, One way that I think we could say it is often when it comes to depression, we are wrestling with things that have happened, maybe to us, that we didn't fully understand why they've happened, right? And so, it's sort of a God did get it wrong kind of battle of thinking in our mind, all right? Now, look, there's a lot of things that can be attached to depression. We talked about that last week. But in regards to thinking, it's often something's happened in the past. This is what we wrestle with. Today, we're wrestling with what we call anxiety, which is often keyed towards something in the future, right? It's the thinking, though, that God will get this wrong, that he will get this wrong. And so often they work together. That's why we're tackling them in this series that way. So, most things that I read regarding anxiety present a common teaching. And so, I want to show you a little bit of that common teaching. Um, It goes like this. You are anxious about things that may never happen. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's often the case. I agree. We we are anxious about things that may never actually happen. So, why waste your time and energy on what may never happen? All right, that's, that's the thinking. Therefore, focus on the positive future that you desire. Now, I'm gonna tell you, I agree with all three of those statements. I do. Anybody else remember Jesus saying something like this? Why worry about tomorrow? He said that, like in a really popular sermon, right? Why are you worrying about tomorrow? Tomorrow hasn't happened yet. You got enough stuff today to pay attention to, all right? I'm saying, yeah, I agree. Uh, Scripture calls us to realize how we think is powerful, that what is, what is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, Paul says in Philippians, think about those things. Think in a positive light, all right? So, I'm saying this sounds right. I agree. But I also want to show you something else today. And Psalm 27 is going to be the anchor point for us today. We're not going to look at the whole psalm, um, but hopefully by the time we're done, there's going to be a verse or two that you ought to know by heart by the time we're done, all right? So, Psalm 27, a psalm of David. Let me start with a couple of verses because I want you to see how he thinks, all right? Psalm 27, verse 3, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. 
Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. If you skip to verse 10, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Now, here's what's interesting to me. David is not saying that an army is besieging him. He is not saying that war has broken out over him. He is not saying that his father and mother have forsaken him. He says, though, which we could translate if. If. He's not saying this is happening to him. He's saying if it happened. All right, so here's what I want, here's what I want you to recognize. What is David's approach to dealing with anxiety? Here's his approach. Consider the worst things that can happen to you. That's like totally opposite from the common approach. It's, it's exactly the opposite of the most common advice. He's imagining the worst. Now, that would lead me to a question, why? Why would he take this approach? And when I read the rest of the psalm, I'm convinced that this is the answer. He wants a strategy of dealing with anxiety that will work against anything. Anything. The common advice that I gave to you earlier, although it is good advice, it is only as powerful as your ability to think positively. There's something in that, but th that's it. The common advice that I showed you earlier only exists if bad things don't happen. You may not know this, but I'm going to tell you, bad things do happen. And so a strategy that denies or ignores the evil in this world is blind. It's blind. We are about to see the Bible give us a way of dealing with anxiety that says, you can go ahead and consider the worst because this strategy will work against anything. Anything. An entire army against me, it will work. If my family is against me, it will work. So, what is the strategy? That's what we want to know. Verse 4 is the text that we're really going to anchor in today. And it's one of those that I would encourage you to put to memory. It really is. Um, if you're going to learn uh, a text from the Psalms, this is, this is just, I think, a great one. So let's, let's read it. Psalm verse 27, or chapter 27, verse 4. Here we go. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Now, what I've highlighted here are the three verbs, all right, that he gives, the, the three verbs. But, but what I'm going to show you is I believe that the structure and what he's saying here is that verb number two and verb number three are actually helping us understand verb number one. And because of what it says here, it's really, there's three verbs, but it's one thing. It's one thing. So look at it again. One thing I ask from the Lord, this do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. What does that mean? Well, I think we got to start with realizing David, when he says the house of the Lord, he's not talking about a physical place. 
He's not. Now, for them in that day, that would have been the temple, right? The place where they would have recognized God's presence. And I, I don't think, because again, you read the rest of the psalm, David's not simply referring to a physical place, living in the temple. Um, even the Levites, who were the priests in that day, they were the ones who would serve in the temple. Um, they would serve a week at a time, two times a year. We read in the Scripture that there were some, like, rooms around the, the courts of the temple where when they were there for their week, they would be able to have a place to reside. But even they didn't live there. You don't live in the temple. So what does it mean? This is what I think he's saying when I read this psalm. To dwell is to live in the unbroken presence of God face to face. To live in the unbroken presence of God face to face. And I'm adding that face to face part because as you read the rest of this psalm, which I'm encouraging you to do this week, you will see by the time you get to like verse 8 and verse 9, he's talking about the face of God, the face of God. He, he, he wants to see God's face. What is that about? Well, think about it this way. Each time that you attend a gathering of Heart of Life, um, you are typically in the presence of some form of the band, all right? Each time, a little different in terms of how many musicians, you know, how, how many instruments, all that, but you're in the presence of the band. But you can't say that you have met them simply because you have heard them play. You can say that you've met them when you walk up to them face to face. Because from distance, you don't have a relationship, not personal. The face is the relational gate to the heart, right? When you approach someone, you're not looking at their feet. When people do that, that's weird, right? If they're talking to you and they're looking at your feet or even they're looking at your shoulder, it's like, that, that's not how you, no, you, you, it is the face. Personal interaction happens at the face. It's where we see and we hear. So think of it this way. The Bible also tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And man, they do, right? You're able to go outside in the night and you look across all those stars. And I mean, what it says about God's greatness. But you cannot know God personally simply through nature. You can determine something about him, but you can't know him personally simply through nature any more than you can know someone else personally simply by observing the work that they do or, or sending them emails and text or reading their personality profile, right? You can get all kinds of info about them, but you don't know them. And David is saying, knowing God in this personal face-to-face -face way, living in the unbroken presence of God is the one key to dealing with anxiety. It's the anchor. So, let's try to say this in a personal way, all right? I'll say it for me. You can plug yourself in if you want to. My anxiety is directly proportional to the vulnerability of my greatest joys. The things in my life that I determine, right, bring me joy, those things that I would consider their vulnerability, can they be taken? Are they at risk? That is directly proportional to the anxiety that I experience.
okay? Likewise, my anxiety occurs when any of the good things in my life become the one thing that I think I need to be happy. So, you and I, we have been given lots and lots of good things in our life. I mean, family is a good thing. Friendship is a good thing. Romance is a good thing. Your career is a good thing. Lots and lots of good things in our life. But the point is, when you take one of those good things and you make it the one thing that you need to have joy, you are opening the door for anxiety because all of those things, though they are good, they are vulnerable to loss. So one more. My anxiety disappears when God becomes my one thing because he is never vulnerable. So let's be clear. Let's be clear. When I'm talking about anxiety today, I am not talking about um, a general, what I believe to be healthy, biblical care, all right? And I'm saying that because there's even places in the Bible where like the Apostle Paul will talk about how he feels, and, and we could use the word anxiety, it's the word pressure, for all the churches, the churches that he's helped to start, and, and, and he feels like a pressure that he cares for them. It, it's like what parents would feel for their kids or what a friend would care for someone. A caring attitude, a caring heart, that is not what we're talking about today, but we are talking about what happens when, when anxiety turns into this fearful enslaving, draining anxiety because it takes life from you because the good things that you've made the one thing can be taken from you. Anything but God is vulnerable. Nothing can take him from you. That's what David's saying in verse 5. If you look in verse 5, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. And again, I don't think David is saying, if I could just get to the temple, then I'd be safe. Like, if I could just get inside the temple walls, then I would be safe. No, he's saying, I'm only safe when God is the one thing I want most of all. When I'm with you, because they can never be taken. So, let's go back to David's example. Um, he says, though my father and my mother forsake me, right, the, lo the Lord is with me. I, I think that's such an appropriate example for him to give us today during this Christmas season, because what I have observed is that much of the anxiety that people wrestle with at Christmas time really is centered around family. It's around family. Sometimes it's an anxiety that's felt because family that used to be with you is no longer with you. Maybe they've passed. But a lot of the time, it's also anxiety, not because someone has died, but it's because there is a brokenness that exists within family relationships, and they really, even though they say we would never want to, they really wish they could gather around a living room with the people that ought to love each other, but because of brokenness, they can't. And at Christmas time, right, it's that season where we think about families and we think about what should be and what matters most, and I, I think that's the reason we experience it much this time of year. And so, when David says, like parents forsaking you, does that ever happen? Yeah, unfortunately. And likely you've somewhere along the way heard somebody, right, talk about, hey, my parents let me down. Uh, I will never forget what they either did to me or didn't do for me. And, and, and you, you've heard somebody probably use language like, man, I just, I just can't get past that, and I don't think that I ever will. It is a declaring 
that it is impossible to be happy because of that. And I'm telling you, anxiousness occurs when the good thing, which in this case is family, has been declared the one thing, but now it's been lost because it's vulnerable. Please believe me that I am not minimizing the hurt today. I'm not. This hurt is real, but the maximizing of this hurt really does reflect the truth that even something this good like family is not built to be the one thing. I really thank you guys for praying for my mom again this week, and uh, she was back in the hospital. She's doing better. She has pneumonia, um, but she is recovering uh, again. And so I really do thank you for praying for her. Um, but y'all, some, something really, I'm going to call it powerful and weird, which they often go together, happened this week for me. Um, she came home around Wednesday within 24 hours there was a little sign of her being weak, and early Friday morning, and when I say early Friday morning, I mean it's like it's dark, it's in the night. My dad calls, asks me to come over. I get over to their house. Um, she's weak, and she is breathing ridiculously hard. I mean, like, just can't stop, just really hard. And so we evaluate for a few minutes and decide, I mean, we, she's too weak, we can't get her in the car. Uh, we call the ambulance. Ambulance comes. Um, they, you know, evaluate her. We tell them where we want her to go, which is to the hospital that she normally goes to. It's where her doctors are. It's what she's most familiar with. Um, but then the point comes where they tell us, you know, her condition is bad. Um, levels are bad, and so they stop at the closer hospital and don't take her to the one that we desired. And the next thing you know, I'm standing in an ER room with my dad, and um, they're asking um, a question that goes like this, if her heart stops, what do you want to do? And we knew the answer to that because she had answered that question um, before. But you don't ever like that question, right? So I'm being really transparent with you today to tell you, though, that what, what even more was going on in my mind was that everything that I just described to you Everything were triggers. They were triggers of something that I experienced in January when I lost, when we lost Whitney. A call in the middle of, I mean, a wake up in the middle of the night, weak, struggling to breathe, call an ambulance, comes to the house. We want to go to this hospital, a call that comes and says we can't go to that hospital because it's so severe, and then a question of the heart. And I'm standing in a hospital room, an ER room, on Friday, kind of one of those moments where you're going, really? Is this really happening? And y'all, I was standing in an ER room that was one door away from where Wit was, literally on the other side of the wall. I texted Jen, my wife, and said, here's where I'm standing. And she sent a really quick text back to me that I'm going to just call it code, all right, because um, she sent me just a few words, but she and I 
have kind of learned something this year to where we have learned a couple of what I'm going to call techniques, strategies that when each of us might find ourselves in just like you're feeling it, all right? When it comes to the anxiety, when it comes to whatever it is, you're, you're feeling it and it's heavy. And you can, there, there's a couple of things that we have been taught this year that the way I describe it is it just enables you to stop and kind of let your mind just breathe for a moment so that then you can start to think correctly. I felt sorrow. I did. I felt sorrow for the past. I felt sorrow for the present. I felt sorrow for what my mom was going through and what my dad was going through. And I, I, th I think I've come to the point I think I always will. I think I always will. I'm starting to believe the Bible actually only makes the promise of no sorrow the next time we all gather in a different place. All right? So in this one, there's just going to be sorrow. But what I also was able to begin to do was to roll through the truths that I knew to be about the situation that I was in, in part because it kind of walked through the truths that I have learned this year that are anchored in a God who is not vulnerable, even when I feel most vulnerable. And again, I was reminded, y'all, I love my family more than I will ever know how to say. And as long as God gives me breath, I'm going to love them, and I'm going to serve them, and I'm going to try to protect them, and I'm going to try to provide for them. And I'm telling you, I would die for my family. I love them that much. But y'all, I was reminded again, standing in an ER room, they can't be my one thing. Because they are just as vulnerable as me. There is nothing wrong with loving them with all my life, but they can't be my one thing. And yours can't either. See, nobody wants to bring this up. Nobody wants to talk about this kind of stuff. But I love the fact that David a long time ago had the guts to call it. So, come on, how does God, how does God become our one thing? How, how are we able to say that he is so that we can love our families right? so that we can appreciate all the good things that he's given us in the, in the right way. How does God become the one thing? Well, that's what the rest of the text is really about. And so, if we go back to verse 4, you're going to see there's two parts, two parts to how he becomes that one thing. And really, the rest of this psalm breaks down in those two parts. I'm about to show you the first part, and then later in the psalm, verse 8 through 10, I think deal with that first part. And then I'm going to show you a second part, and verse 11 through 14 deal with that second part. I'm just going to give you the phrases and see if we can understand what does this mean. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. How? To gaze on the beauty of the Lord. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord. Now again, I don't think that David is just talking physical eyes of being able to see God. Like, I don't, I don't think, now he could have somewhere along the way, but I don't think he's having, right, a, a vision of seeing God. W what does he mean here? We are, we are moving back to the difference between knowing about God and knowing God. The difference between knowing that God is loving versus, versus experiencing God's love. What does it mean to gaze on his beauty? Long time ago, Augustine said it could be described in terms of three words. So I want to give you those three words. It starts with the word retain. And what Augustine meant is you retain a truth about God. 
you find a truth as you open God's Word and you read Scripture, and, and suddenly there is this truth about who God is from His Word. You see it. You learn it. But Augustine said, you don't stop there. You don't just stop when you learn the truth. The, the next word is to contemplate. It means that you look at God through that truth of, of what you just learned about Him. What does this really show me about God? Do I really understand that this is who He is? Am I living as though I believe that this is who God is? It is saying, I want to see God, not, not just like with physical eyes, but like the Apostle Paul would say in, in Ephesians, he wants to see with the eyes of his heart. And then there's a third word. It's the word delight. Because the idea is as, as you begin to process that and you're asking those questions and you're rolling that around in your heart, there, the result at times is an excitement because of who God is. At times there is a joy. At times there is a peace. At times there is a comfort. You begin to delight in who he is. And Augustine said, here's the issue. Y'all, we tend to do this with everything else in our life except God. It's like, that's true. So, a career, maybe it's a house that you want, maybe it's a person that you want. You're, you're like, you got your eye on somebody, and that whole process of, of dating begins and it all, right? Think about how that works in everything else in our life. We, we, we find something, and then we start to roll that around in our head, and, and we're imagining what would be like, and we're exploring the truth of what we've just found and how this affects our lives, and we begin to delight in that. I mean, y'all, we do it with everything else. What if we did it? with God. What if we went further than just showing up and writing down some truths of who he is, but we started to contemplate, wait, do I really see him this way? Does my life show that I believe this is who he is and what this can become? And suddenly there is a joy that begins to to, to swell in excitement at times, a comfort sometimes? What if you choose to do that with God, to gaze on his beauty? But there's a second phrase. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Now, I'm just going to jump to it and tell you that that word seek is a very specific Hebrew word that means go get counsel. Go get, we would say, instruction. And so, in this context, it is to go get the counsel of God, to go get the instruction of God, to know His will. The idea is to follow, to obey. That's what it means. I want you to recognize that both gazing on His beauty and following His counsel are essential to what it means, really, to follow Jesus. It is. Gazing on his beauty, who he is, right? But being overwhelmed with who, and, 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 and yet to seek his counsel and to follow him. Watch this. If you only seek his will and obey, but don't gaze upon his beauty your one question becomes, what are we doing for God? And if you're not careful, you will appear to live for completing a task more than you actually love God and the people, and typically you will turn into a great Pharisee appearing harsh and legalistic. Likewise, if you only gaze on his beauty, but never do his will, your primary question becomes something like, like where can I find a church where, where the worship is just like makes me feel like I'm, I'm touching the face of God, right? 
But because you're doing nothing, you appear to be a part of the self-serving, hypocritical reason why people on the outside don't trust church because it's all talk and no life. Come on, you know how this works. Because in any of the great relationships that you rather actually have, great friendships, great marriage, this is how it works. In a marriage, yes, you, you gaze on their beauty. There ought to be the time that you spend doing that, who they are, right? Sharing a closeness, sharing an intimacy. But it also means you find out how to serve them and you do that. So, like, imagine this scenario. My wife says, hey, would you do this and this for me? And my response is, hmm, nah. That's not honestly really convenient for me today. And, and if I'm just being truthful, I don't like to do that anyway. If I choose to live selfish, right, can we just say that there probably won't be a whole lot of gazing going on either. <laughs> we get that. We understand that. That there are disciplines for seeking God's will, his word, and as we pray and, and as we meditate on those things, that there are also disciplines of living in his will, that, that we choose to leave, live simple in a lifestyle instead of materialistic, that we choose to live forgiving in our lifestyle instead of bitter, that we choose to live serving in our lifestyle instead of selfish. So one more question. Like it says you know, to gaze on the beauty of God and to seek his counsel. And, and yet, David still uses that language in the temple. And, and it does make me wonder if there were times that, like, David was in the temple. There were times he went to the temple, and I imagine how he watched what went on there. And when he watched the sacrifices that were made, Suddenly, he sees something of the beauty of God's justice and God's holiness. A God so good that he will not overlook sin, and a God so holy that he must deal with evil. But he also, looking upon those sacrifices, would have seen something of God's mercy. A God who wants to deal with our sins so that we can still approach him. A God who wants to forgive our sin. And it just, it just made me think this week, I, I, I want you to consider if David, way back then, was able to gaze at the beauty of God through that temple worship, how much more of the beauty of God are you and I now able to see when we gaze at God through the face of Jesus? In John chapter 2, it records it's one of those moments where, where Jesus has disrupted the temple. He clears things out, and they're going, who do you think you are to do this in the temple? And in John chapter 2, it gives us his response. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? And John says, but the temple he had spoken of was him. Was him. Oh, y'all, when we look at the temple, who is Jesus now? Right? We're not having to simply look at a sacrifice on an altar in the temple long ago, but we see the face of the one who loves us more than anyone has ever loved. We see him dying for us. We see blood flowing down that face, declaring, Father, forgive them, because they, they don't know what they're doing, and he is forsaken for us. 
If David saw so much of the beauty of God in the temple that it would turn him into a man that could face an entire army and still stand, then I'm saying, who do you think God can make you as a man or a woman who beholds with unveiled faces the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? Who can he make you to be? Uh, we see the evidence in David's life. I love verse 13. I love, he says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Love it. Love it. His anxiety disappears when he sees God as his one thing. One thing that will never be vulnerable one thing that will always be present with him, one thing that will always be good. We've seen it in the lives of faithful people throughout the centuries. Um, there is a, a, a well-known story of an English missionary named Alan Gardner. Um, he lived a long time ago, 1851, which makes this story even more amazing to me because he was on his way to South America to share the good news of Jesus. Now, come on, that is absolutely amazing to me. Like, we got people today trying to decide if they want to travel to a different company or country to share the good news. Like, do I want to get on a plane and fly for 10 hours, right? And this dude in 1851 is going to board a ship, spend probably half of a year. I mean, what these missionaries went through to get to where they went— he ends up shipwrecked on a remote island. He and his companions try to stay alive until somebody finds them. But nobody did. And Alan Gardner died on that remote island of hunger, far away from his family. You would go, man, that's, that's like a horrible story. And although too late, eventually a search party arrived, and they found Gardner's body, and right beside his body was his journal. And on the very last page of his journal, he had written two things, Psalm 34 and then a statement. Psalm 34.10 reads like this, the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And then he wrote, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. They're like, wait, 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 wait. How could he not be angry? How could he not be scared? It's because he found the one thing. The one thing never vulnerable. The one thing always present. The one thing always good. It works even on remote islands. It works in ER rooms. And it'll work wherever you may find yourself in this journey. Because the one thing is God. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you stir in our hearts this morning. I'm asking that it will go far beyond some truths that we write down. That as we contemplate, and as we begin to delight, as we begin to seek your counsel and a desire to obey, God, may you give us eyes that see that we can declare together the greatest thing, the one thing is to be able to know you face to face 
an unbroken presence. God, I pray for those who need to be reminded of that today. I pray for those who need for the first time to turn to you in faith. God, as you speak, help us believe. In the name of Jesus, I pray it. Amen.